Welcome everyone to our February uh, membership meeting. Tonight we're so excited uh, to welcome Susan Crook, who's going to talk about small hive beetles with us tonight. Um, let's let's talk about um, how to support Pub to begin with. Our membership includes a swarm list, and we had 250 calls last year. Um, and we have some really interesting updates on the swarm list to, to send out tonight. The Bee Buddy Program, which has 65 members, uh, mentors, and learners, which has also been updated. Uh, the map has been updated recently. And we are going to talk uh, at length after Susan's presentation with Jana about Bee Days at the Apiary. Of course, our library is fully stocked and our equipment rental uh, is up and ready to go. And let's not forget that on the website, we have a lovely classified section. Uh, we want to congratulate Sean Sloan for receiving the OSU scholarship. I had a chance to talk to her um, about a week ago, and she is super excited and very appreciative of our help. She's already com completed the first phase of her training and is ready now to work with a mentor and uh, move into a very interesting aspect of her of her Master B experience. So we hope to see some more from her uh, as the year progresses. Um, Susie is running an, an awesome bee school this year. It's designed for beginning beekeepers and she shares detailed and actionable information. Um, there are four two hour lessons for a total of eight hours via Zoom, live or recorded. And this year we're adding a two hour apiary session with Susie and Jana at, uh, at the apiary at Green Acres. The cost is 110 for all four classes and the apiary section. And of course it includes the new third edition book of honeybee biology and beekeeping by Dewey Karen. And um, we ask uh, people that are in the bee school to supercharge their experience and partner with a mentor or learner from the bee buddy map. The B-School dates, they happen on Thursday, February 9th, March 9th, April 13th, and May 11th, always from 7 to 9 p.m. The class covers introduction to beekeeping and equipment, obtaining and installing bees, honeybee biology and behavior, inspections, varroa mite biology, integrated pest management strategies, which is really important for me, seasonal management for the Pacific Northwest, and of course, honey harvest. Um, upcoming speakers include Frank Rukinovich, who's going to talk about varroa amitraz resistance and monitoring. And then in April, we have Dr. Ramesh Sigili, who's going to talk about varroa and nutrition management. Of course, we're always open for suggestions for new speakers, so you can email me or any of the board members to make your suggestions. Without further ado, we'd like to uh, invite Susan Crook to talk about small hive beetles. She has a very extensive and lovely bio here that I'd like you to take a look at. Um, when, when we're um, experiencing um, Susan's presentation, feel free at any time to ask questions about her or her, um, her ideas about small beetles. Having said that, I will turn it over to Susan. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Let's see here. All righty. So first of all, thank you guys for having me here. Um, I'm just so excited. The whole way that I ended up here is my dear friend, Brian Fackler, who I went through the Cornell program with and um, really got to know uh, okay, got to know he and his wife, and I'm just, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I am from Charleston, South Carolina. I do have a little bit of a Southern accent, so if you don't understand something I'm saying, please put something in the chat box, raise your hand. Um, I look forward to running through this fun little presentation, and hopefully we'll have time uh, to have questions because I like to view these things as a chance to have a conversation. So let's have a conversation about small hive beetles. Um, I call this with a twist because 
even though they're a pest and we don't like them and we don't want them, I hope that you find out that hey, they Susan, do have some cool things. Yes. Your, your slide is not showing. We're seeing a pub slide. Oh, you are? Oh, oh there, there it goes. goes. Sorry. That was my problem. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that, Susan. There we That's go. That's okay. Not a problem. Not a problem. But anyway, so we're, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to be mindful of time. I know that this is a work night um, for everyone. So we shall start. All right. So I figured we would just jump right in. I don't know how many of you have actually seen hive beetles in your hive. Um, what I'd like to do is do this short little video of a hive inspection that's going to show you what hive beetles look like. Um, and we're going to talk about it as we go through it. So hold on one second. Uh oh. Okay, there we go. There's no sound because I'm going to talk to you through it. Um, so typical beginning of a hive inspection, you know, smoke. But what I want you to notice here is this apiary is shaded. And that is one of the things we're going to talk about. You really don't want to have your boxes in a shaded area. And we're going to talk about why in a minute. Um, I want you to look at the inside of this telescoping cover. And you're going to see those are hive beetles. Wow. Can you see them? Yeah, they're just, they're running like crazy. Um, all of the bees, so of course, when you do an inspection, you open your box and you want to see, make sure the queen's not up there. Well, these bees are busy managing hive beetles and there are a lot of them. And so in this video, I'm talking a little bit about, you know, what hive beetles are and things like that. But I want you to look over here on the left, the bottom left. I don't know if I can get my cursor over here, but look along the edges. And I want you to watch the hive beetles. So you've got hive beetles that are running along the top of this box where it meets that inner cover. And it's almost like they're on a race. Do you see them on the front along that edge? And I want you to watch how the bees are trying to manage those beetles. And I also want you to notice how many bees are on the top of that inner cover as well. If you can see that center hole of the inner cover, which you probably, it's a standard inner cover that a lot of you probably use. Um, what, what is happening are the bees are running these beetles up through that center hole onto that inner cover. And we're gonna talk about that as well. So when I open this inner cover, of course it's propolized pretty tight, which I'm sure you guys have experienced, but that's one of the ways that um, the honeybees do try to manage their hive beetles. But I want you to look at the inside of this inner cover. And also I want you to note there is a Swiffer sheet right here. And we're gonna talk about all of this in the presentation, but this just gives you a good visual. That's a Swiffer sheet in the corner that I just put down. Look at all of those bees, y'all. Hive beetles, they're managing hive beetles. So most of our hives down here in Charleston, South Carolina have hive beetles, but this is exceptionally bad as far as hive beetles go. Um, but the crazy thing is, is once you get into the hive, believe it or not, the bees are managing the hive beetles. Uh, there are no hive beetles within um, that colony. So we're going to get started now. All right. There are four things that I want to accomplish. And if I'm going too quickly, just because of time, I want, I want you to stop me, please, and tell me to slow down. We're going to talk about what are small hive beetles. We're going to discuss their life cycle because it's really important to understand the life cycle of a uh, small hive beetle because it really impacts uh, the honeybees. We're going to talk about how they interact within the hive because that kind of impacts uh, your management style. And then we're going to break down the management of small hive beetles. Uh, you see the picture on the right. I think that's a pretty cool uh, illustration of what a hive beetle looks like. It's almost intimidating and reminds me of one of the Egyptian scarab beetles. So what are small hive beetles? Well, first and foremost, uh, a small hive beetle is a secondary pest. And I'm not sure how many newer beekeepers we have on here. Um, but a secondary pest is a pest that takes advantage of a weak or a sick or a declining colony. Another secondary pest would be uh, a wax moth. They typically come in once something's going on with the colony. 
Um, another important thing that you need to understand about hive beetles are they are not native to the United States. They are actually from Africa. Um, they coexist with African bees. Uh, if you kind of remember some of the traits of races of bees, African bees tend to swarm and abscond frequently. So hive beetles are actually viewed as scavengers in Africa. So they'll go in and kind of clean up the mess that's left behind. Um, and another important thing to understand that they're not native is we, they don't have any uh, natural predators here. So our ecosystem is designed to be in balance and there is nothing here in the United States in, in nature that controls their population. Um, an important thing that we're gonna talk about is hive beetles can coexist with your honeybees. Um, it's crazy to think, I want you to understand that when you open your box, if you do see hive beetles, it is not a death sentence for your honeybees. And we're gonna talk about how to manage that. Funny enough, so I am in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, in 1996 was when the first hive beetle was discovered actually in downtown Charleston. It was shipped off, uh, a fella had a couple of colonies that he lost. They had never seen anything like it. They shipped off a sample to Dr. Mike Hood up at Clemson University. Dr. Hood had never seen it. They couldn't identify it. It had never been here. And in 1998, it was actually properly identified down in Port St. Lucie, Florida. And then by the time they identified it uh, in 1998, it had already spread through seven states. Um, I want you to understand because you're going to, we're going to review this and see this over and over and over the interactions between the honeybees and the beetles. There are two things that those honeybees are trying to do. They are trying to remove those beetles from their colony. They do not want them in there and they especially do not want the beetles on their comb. And those small hive beetles, their goals are to remain inside the hive and they want to reproduce. Basically, you know, any living organism tries to reproduce. So that's exactly what those small hive beetles are trying to do. So they, they live and reproduce in honeybee colonies. They have been found in bumblebee nests, not very frequently though. Um, the life cycle, as I said, it's important to understand this. This probably looks familiar to you guys. Uh, it's four stages, just like our honeybee. You have the eggs, the larva, the pupa, and the adult. Um, the funny thing is, though, is we have bee math, right, which is pretty, I wouldn't say exact, there's nothing exact in life, but we can do bee math and we can project when eggs are going to hatch, when things are going to be capped, when things are going to emerge, queens, workers, drones. Well, for the small hive beetle, it is not exact, and we're going to talk about that. So it begins with eggs, just like our honeybees do, and roughly in three days, give or take, a day or two on either side, those eggs are gonna hatch into larva. Now, the larva of a small hive beetle is not spoiled like our honeybees. They do not have nurse bees that are feeding that larva. Uh, the larva of a small hive beetle has to go in search of food. And that is the problem with small hive beetles in our, in our hives. So the larva hatches and immediately starts looking to fatten itself up. So it's going to go through your comb, it's going to go through your bee bread, it's going to go through your brood, and it's going to get all the nutrients it can get. It's typically in the larval stage for about 10 days. And then once it has reached maturity, it is going to head out of your colony. It's going to hit the ground. It's going to try to burrow down into the ground about four inches where it will pupate. And that can take four to six weeks. You can see that on the left side here. Um, and once it finishes pupation, then it will emerge as an adult and the cycle starts all over again. So the reason why this life cycle is not exact and we can't really rely on beetle math is because there are two things, there are two components that are really necessary for this life cycle and that is heat and it's humidity. So if you by chance have weather and it's cold or the ground is dry, then that's gonna disrupt, lengthen, or completely get rid and stop the life cycle of the small hive beetle. A lot of people ask me, how in the world do hive beetles even find our colonies? This is a funny little story. This is a nuke that I placed in my yard about two o'clock in the afternoon, had a capped queen cell that was about to emerge. Went outside 7.30 in the evening. Um, I was blown away that they were already bringing in pollen after about five, five and a half hours. So I started a video. 
What I wasn't expecting, though, is to see a hive beetle land on the landing board, and you're going to see that in just a second, within five hours of this box of bees. Do you see it? There it is. So hive beetles are very stealthy. They try to sneak in. She's going to snug up against the screen. She's going to wait and watch. And then when she sees her opportunity, there she goes. So I do have to say those guard bees didn't do a very good job, did they? They just let her walk right in. So now once that hive beetle is in the colony, what happens? Well, they seek out hiding places. And remember what we said earlier, that hive beetle wants to remain in the colony and it wants to get to the comb to reproduce. Those honeybees want to get that bee beetle out as soon as possible. So fortunately for the uh, beetle, it's smaller than the honeybee. So they tend to hide out in nooks, cracks, and crannies. You can see here a beetle that's hiding at the end of the end bar or a top bar against the side of the box. The honeybees uh, can't really get into that crevice. So they are going to try to keep that beetle where it is um, and not let the beetle leave. So a beetle can actually lay eggs in that crevice. It's not ideal, but they can do that. And hopefully these seem to be pretty attentive uh, bees. And if you look on the left, my guess is the two on the left probably have a hive beetle crowd at the end of that top bar. Um, but fortunately, if they're on top of it, the bees are on top of it, let's say that that hive beetle did lay some eggs and they emerged as larva, they can remove the larva. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a second. So again, here are the eggs. They, they look very similar to honeybee eggs uh, in color and shape. They are quite a bit smaller, though. They're about 1.4 millimeters, and they tend to lay their eggs in clusters or clutches, as you can see on the right. Um, and again, they would love to lay their eggs on your brood or on your uh, pollen and your bee bread. but if they can't get to it, they will lay eggs in nooks, cracks, and crannies. All right, so this is where it gets ugly. And really, this is the most damaging part of the life cycle. So once those eggs hatch in about three days, four days, give or take, they start to ferociously look for food. That is their goal is to fatten themselves up and to get outside of the hive so that they can pupate and start the cycle all over. If you see on both of these photographs, you see the bee bread, the different colored cells. As they work their way through these cells, they're actually defecating and there is a yeast that is associated with their defecation and with the hive beetle in general. And it actually ferments the nectar and the honey and all of these products of the hive and what happens, we refer to it as sliming, which is definitely not a scientific term, but that's what we refer to it as because that's what it looks like and that's what it is. It creates this liquefied substance that contaminates the comb. The bees will not get on this comb anymore. They don't want anything to do with it. Uh, that substance then just drips down and it destroys the rest of the frame. If that frame is on a top box, it'll continue to drip down to the boxes below it. Um, and once that process starts, guys, it's really important that you catch it pretty quickly. If you do, you can remove the affected frames and try to salvage your uh, colony. But if you don't catch it and it progresses more frames and more frames, because your bees are not gonna wanna be on these frames, they're gonna keep moving, keep moving, to the point where they're like, we're not gonna be here. This is not a good place for us. And they're gonna abscond. And then once the bees abscond, you're really gonna have a mess on your hands um, because there's no measure to take care of them or try to limit their access to the rest of the colony or the rest of the frames. Um, this can happen very quickly. So if the eggs hatch in three days, then you've got larva. I mean, within days, the, High beetles can do this within seven to 10 days and take down your colony and collapse it. I refer to this as the destruction. You can see here um, on the left side, uh, uh, basically a pile or a cluster of the larva. And you can see that on the side of the um, hive body as well. Uh, 
Hive beetle larva tends, they tend to cluster like this as opposed to a wax moth larva, which tends to be on its own. A lot of people ask, well, how do I know if this is a small hive beetle larva or if this is a wax moth larva? Well, hive beetle larvas are smaller than wax moth larvas. They are also um, usually different coloration, but the defining traits that they have are small hive beetle larvae have spines that go down their back and small beetle um, larvae have three sets of legs or three pairs of legs at the front of their body. So as opposed to wax moth. Um, so there you go. You see the larva on the honey frame. In the middle picture, you can see a, a hive that was a complete collapse. They started in the top box and all of that liquefied fermented honey has dripped down into the brood box. The bees said, we can't handle this and they left. Um, the right side picture, you can see that's the bottom box. But I also want you to notice something, and I don't know how clearly you can see this, but if you look, let me see if I can get my point right here. Do you guys know what that is? That's wax moth, that, that webbing, netting, silk. Um, so what that tells me in general, again, this kind of backs up the fact that a secondary pest, this was a weakened, stressed, not well hive to begin with. And so you, not only do you have small hive beetles, but you also have wax moth in there. Um, so it's just a mess, but I, I do wanna tell you this. If you ever come across this, there is a smell associated with the slime that you will not forget. And I'm at the point now where when I get a call and I have to go help somebody as, as I'm walking up to their hive, I can sometimes smell the smell before I even get to the hive and open it and know exactly what it is. It's definitely a smell that you're not gonna forget. All right, so now let's get into the cool things about their interactions, adaptations. Uh, the honeybees, like you saw on that video in the beginning, they like to corral the beetles. So they'll chase the beetles up the sides of the box, like we saw through that center hole, and they'll try to keep them up above the brood nest or the honey supers up above that inner cover. And they will, they'll do a good job of that. You saw that in action. On the right side, this was an interesting case. Um, a woman called me up and actually the slime was coming out of her front entrance by this point. <clears throat> um, but what they do is they can actually build prisons. So this is the inside of her inner cover. She had a feeding jar in that center hole. So the beetles could not go up and be, you know, out of the box per se, like we've seen before. So what they do is they build these jails and they corral the hive beetles in these jails. And unfortunately, when you open that up, it breaks the seal and all of those beetles go flying down into your colony. And it can actually be problematic for a strong hive as well. But if you can see, it literally on the top of each one of those frames was a prison. And like, here's the entrance where they would push them in and then they would stand outside. So it's pretty fascinating. Now, this is where I hope that, that we walk away from this conversation that you say, you know what, that's kind of cool. All right, so here is a standard photograph illustration of a hive beetle. On the very far left, you see a typical head, thorax, abdomen, three body parts, right? You see the antenna, you see the three pairs of legs. On the outside of this hive beetle is a very hard shell that honeybees cannot sting through. But here on their belly side, it's soft. So ideally you don't want, the hive beetle does not want that honeybee to have access to its belly. It's kind of like a lot of other animals that they like to protect their bell bellies. If you look here on the right side, I think this is fascinating. They have the ability to tuck everything underneath that shell. So their head, their antenna, see their antenna is completely tucked under, their legs are completely tucked under, their head is completely tucked under. We refer to that as turtling, not scientific term, but basically they have the ability to hunker themselves down onto a surface and a honeybee cannot flip that hive beetle over. So it can't sting it, it can't flip it over. So guess what? It's stuck in there. That hive beetle is achieving its goal of just being able to remain in the, 
colony. Here's another really cool thing is mimicry. Um, number one is they do have the associated yeast and not only does it ferment uh, your honey and nectar, but it also has a smell that's similar to almost an alarm pheromone. And there's, there's research that you can see on the bottom um, of my slides. All the research is here and I'll send all this out to you guys. Um, but that alarm pheromone is a smell, not that we associate with alarm pheromone, but it's a smell that stressed out, weakened colonies send out that they just have. So the hive beetles mimic that smell and it's like a call to arms. It rallies the troops. You're bringing in more hive beetles because the more hive beetles, the more likely it is to overrun the colony. Uh, the second thing that's really cool is the more time that they are in the colony and the more time they're moving around on the comb and you know they're picking up the sense of the colony. So they are absorbing the comb volatiles, which makes them blend in a little bit more. And you have to remember that inside a hive, it's totally dark. They don't have lights. They don't have headlights or flashlights or anything like that. And so they basically communicate through smell, taste, touch, you know, vibration, things like that. But this right here is the coolest thing. It's the trophallaxis, essentially, the hive beetles convince the honeybees to feed them. And if you look right here on the left side, you see a proboscis on the honeybee and its mandible. And then you've got your, your small hive beetle on the right side. If you note the antenna they have, we call them clubbed antenna. It's that rounded shape on the end of the um, antenna. Essentially what happens is your hive beetle strokes the mandibles of your honeybee and it convinces the honeybee to feed the small hive beetle. And through that, the hive beetle can actually remain in the hive for over six months. They can overwinter in the cluster of bees. Here's a video that demonstrates this. I think it's so cool, Wyatt uh, Mangum. This was kind of an incidental finding, but it does show these hive beetles are corralled back behind a queen cage. You've got your guard bees doing their job, keeping the beetles in check. But those beetles are like, you know what? We're gonna do trickery. That's what my daughter calls it, is trickery. We're gonna convince these bees to feed us. And that's exactly what happens. I think it's fascinating. So you can see the clubbed antenna right there. That beetle is waiting patiently because she knows it's gonna happen. And here we go. I think that's absolutely fascinating. So they really have, the hive beetles have adapted and they have um, developed these, uh, this ability to exist in the hive. And they can live there, like I said, for over six months. They will overwinter within the cluster of the honeybee. Um, that second beetle also gets fed. I think it's just absolutely fascinating, very cool. Nature's really cool. All right, so now what? You've got hive beetles and you're trying to figure out what to do about them or you're trying to avoid getting hive beetles. So we're gonna talk about that. Um, integrative pest management is basically our best practice for pest disease control. It, it's the same with Varroa, um, but we can also use this for small hive beetles. Uh, if you see or you look at this pyramid, you start at the bottom and it's basically the least intrusive or potentially damaging treatment that you can do. The top of the pyramid is your hard chemical. And really with small hive beetles or with anything, you really wanna try to avoid that top spot the best you can. So we're gonna run through a couple of ways that you can utilize integrative pest management to control your hive beetles. <clears throat> the number one thing that you can do is have a strong colony. You want healthy bees. And in order to have healthy bees, you have to manage your Varroa because as we know, Varroa, they vector viruses, disease, they weaken your colonies. You wanna have a robust population. If you look right here on um, the photograph on the right and the bottom, uh, the left and the bottom right, you see full frames of bees. When you look down in between those frames, you have what I call full seams of bees. If you look up at the top right, 
you know, you can see um, that's a spotty brood pattern to begin with. There are not a lot of bees. My guess is, or what that tells me, is this is probably a weakened, stressed colony. And that frame right there is ripe for small hive beetles to take over. So that bottom, or, or my suggestion about appropriate space, what do I mean by that? If you're gonna have a population, you need to make sure that you have enough bees to patrol the number of frames that you have in your box. So you, you know, it kind of, I don't wanna say makes me jealous, but I hear people up in the Northeast that they can just add honey supers and wait for the bees to fill them. I can't do that here in Charleston because if I throw an extra box and I don't have enough bees to cover those frames, then I run the risk of really making a mess in my colony. So I've had to adapt by only adding a certain number of frames at a time, the conversation for another day. But it's really important not to give the hive beetles an opportunity to get into your comb and to lay those eggs. Some of the cultural controls that you probably are already aware of, full sun um, leads to dry ground and dry ground disrupts the life cycle because the larva cannot get into the dry ground. It's not gonna pupate. Some folks have mats under their hives to disrupt their ability to actually burrow into the ground. Jamie Ellis has a really funny story. He's from University of Florida. He has done a lot of research for hive beetles uh, that in their lab, they were studying hive beetles and I think it was an observation hive, hive but larva got out and he said literally climbed down a, a set of stairs out the door through a parking lot true story. You can ask them about it. I'm not kidding. So they can travel. Typically, they pupate within about six feet of your hive, but they can go much further than that. Another word um, of caution is if you have hive beetles, you want to be really careful about using pollen patties because hive beetles absolutely love to get into pollen patties. Number one, it's a nutrition source for them, but number two, they will lay eggs like crazy in pollen patties. Down here this time of year, we are starting our spring expansion already. And if I use a pollen supplement, literally like a one by one or two by two inch piece of patty, and then I have to check five or seven days later to make sure that it's being consumed. Otherwise I remove it. Uh, another thing, and this is just good practice, apiary hygiene is to clean up your dead outs in a timely manner. Because if you don't, then you leave the opportunity for wax moths and small hive beetles to move in and make an absolute mess. The center picture, you see hives that are out in full sun. The pictures on the right, this hive right here is in shade and ended up having a complete hive beetle problem and absconded this photograph down here, this hive. All of this ground is wet and it's shaded. This is a small hive beetle uh, breeding ground. The mechanical controls, you can use beetle gel, Swiffer sheets, screen bottom oil pans. Uh, I like to use a small entrance, y'all. I don't open my entrances up, even in the heat of the summer. As long as they can get in and out, we're good. Um, if you look on the far right, and you saw this in the video, on the corners of this box, you see Swiffer sheets. And these are just the standard cleaning Swiffer sheets that you can get at the grocery store. Make sure you do not get scented you want to get the unscented, ask me how I know because I made the mistake. And what you do is you place those on the corner of your boxes in between your boxes and the hive beetles, their feet get entangled in the fibers. Honeybees don't get tangled up in them. Every now and then you might see one or two, but they, they typically do not get tangled, but it will trap and collect hive beetles. If you see right here, there are what we call beetle blasters or beetle gels. We put those in between the frames typically on the outside because again, hive beetles are being run up the sides and they will go down into the beetle gels that you have oil in and they drown in the oil. This is another example of a beetle gel. You can see the beetles down in the oil. This one hangs over the edge of a frame and it's refillable and reusable. Uh, this is a oil pan. I use this a lot. It's very effective for me, but I also run screen bottoms, and I'm not sure if you use those in the Pacific Northwest, um, but if you do, what happens is the larva and the hive beetles can get into that oil and it traps them. Some people don't use oil because it can be a little messy and they use uh, diatomaceous earth or uh, desiccated lime. 
Um, another thing that some people have used, and this falls under the biological controls, are beneficial nematodes. And essentially, these are just microscopic worms, for lack of a better word, that feed on the pupa in the ground. So if you uh, use beneficial nematodes, it has the potential to kill any hive beetle pupa that might be in the ground around your hive. Honestly, I haven't heard of anyone having huge success with that. That just may be a local issue. As we know, beekeeping is local. Beekeeping is local, beekeeping is local, even within a state. Um, and then the top of the IPM is the chemical controls. One is the Guard Star, that is a liquid, it's permethrin, and you can trench that in the ground around your hive. You have to be extra careful because that will kill your honeybees. I've never used it. Um, the second thing, which was actually one of the first treatments that they came up with, is check mite, which is Kumafos. It actually has been used for Varroa. Um, I don't know anybody that's ever used it. The way that you use the check mite is you staple it onto a corrugated cardboard. You slot it into your bottom board with the idea that the hive beetles are gonna go into the corrugated cardboard to hide, come in contact with the chemical. And then uh, that's all she wrote. But you know, there's a lot of resistance to it there. You can't use it with honey supers on. Uh, you have to wait about 15 days before you can apply it. I mean, before you can put honey supers on if you've used it. I just, I don't know anyone that's really had to resort to the chemical controls, which is actually a good thing. If you can do the other items that we talked about, you should be okay. And basically in summary, they're secondary pests. They're not native. Um, that larval stage, you can see a photograph here. That is the most destructive stage. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my condolences with you ahead of time if you do experience this because it is a really messy cleanup. Um, you can wash your frames out. Uh, some people do. You, you need to freeze them first to kill any eggs that could be in there, but you can wash them out, let the bees kind of clean them up, but I've not had success with that. Strong and healthy colony is your best defense. And then the IPM strategies that we just discussed, which is putting your hives in full sun because they need that warmth and they need humidity. And if you've got dry ground, they can't pupate. Uh, appropriate population to space ratio, oil traps, beetle trays, beetle gel, Swiffer sheets, guard star, small entrances. And here are some references uh, for research that goes through all of this. So with that said, um, I'm gonna stop my share. Does it, I went through that pretty quickly because I'm cognizant of time. It's already 1040 or 741 for y'all. Do y'all have questions? That's a lot of information in a short amount of time. That was fascinating. Oh, thank you. I have a friend who has a really bad small high fetal problem. So I'm gonna be really excited to share all that with her. Oh, absolutely. And I'll send you uh, these PowerPoints that y'all can use if you'd like. And I'll be really excited now that next time I go see her hive, I'll know what's going on. Yeah, you know, it's kind of scary when you open up your colony, especially if you're not used to seeing hive beetles and you've heard about them, and then you open up your colony, your hive, and you see them. It, there is a sense of panic, I think. And I'm here to tell you that you don't have to panic. I All of my hives, for the most part, have hive beetles, unfortunately, and I've got healthy bees. I've got, you know, I manage Varroa very well, um, but if I let my hive get weak or sick or small, or the space to be out of proportion, that's when you run into trouble. So we have um, one question in the chat that says, do you think six inches of cedar chips below the hive would help? It could, you know, there, there's actually um, a little bit of research out there about cedar um, and really some essential oils and things like that. It, it won't hurt, I can say that. And, you know, I think cedar has been known to, um, to discourage other pests as well. 
the most important thing is to have dry under your hive. Um, but it, look, it's, it's worth a shot. I don't see any problem with that. Here's something that's very interesting. So 1998 was when it was first identified properly. Um, no one knew a lot about it. Jamie Ellis at the time was at the University of Georgia getting his PhD. He ultimately got his PhD in South Africa on hive beetles. He does dissertation. He was working with Keith Delaplane at the University of Georgia, and they partnered with Dr. Mike Hood at Clemson, who got the first beetle. They are the ones that started the primary research. And if you look at the research, it's 2002, 2003, 2004. It spiked about 2004. And then it's been like this straight down drop off. Nobody's really doing a lot of research um, on hive beetles anymore because they discovered, okay, well, they're not going to necessarily kill your bees. They're secondary pests. Here are some ways you can control them. However, a guy named Lewis Bartlett, um, Dr. Bartlett at UGA is actually doing some research now on hive beetle things, which is wonderful. So I, I just think it's fascinating that there's not a whole lot of research on hive beetles, but I'm a geek like that. So anybody else? Yes, there's a couple more um, questions slash comments. Someone said that they saw one, a small hive beetle fly into a swarm trap with a swarm. So oh, yes. That's kind, of like, that's kind of like the video that you had. They do. They travel with swarms and they also travel in packages. And um, I had a conversation with Brian Fackler earlier about, you know, pollination contracts. The movement of bees around the country has really contributed to the spread of hive beetles as well as other, you know, pests and pathogens. But they will fly. Absolutely. They can fly up to five miles to find a hive colony. So crazy. Oh, I see it. Okay. So it's like. So. We have another one that says, it sounds like maintaining a low mite load year round is the most effective thing you can do to prevent small hive beetle infestation. Is that accurate? So I could do a whole presentation on this. Yes, maintaining a low mite count is the best thing that you can do for your bees, period. Hive beetles, anything else, because what that's gonna do, it's gonna keep your bees or give your bees the best chance to be healthy, right? It reduces the um, rate of viral transmission, uh, deformed wing virus, paralytic viruses. Uh, it is just the best thing that you can do for your honeybees. So yes, if you manage your bees to be healthy and manage your mite loads, you are definitely gonna help with small hive beetles. And the next That's a great, question. all these are great questions, by the way. We have some pretty great members. I can tell, I love being <laughs> here. Um, so we have another person who is requesting, is there a way I can send a video and ask if it's hive beetles in the video? Oh yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you what, I'm going to put my email address in the chat box. Great. Thank you. Hold on one second. Uh, um, please, any of you reach out to me with any questions. And if I don't know the answer, I will definitely point you in the direction because I'm not afraid to say I don't know. Thank you for that. So, appreciate it. Don't be afraid, y'all, of high beetles. Try to, you know, they are kind of cool, but you just need to be mindful. Well, y'all, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Susan. We're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat now. For oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Great, great job, Susan. Uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming. You guys take care, and I hope I see you again. And please reach out with any questions. Sure. Thank you for staying up so late for us. We really yes, appreciate thank it. Thank you so much, Susan. You're welcome. I'll see you next time. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So members, please don't leave because we've got some more uh, stuff to go over. Brent, do you have anything before you want me to start? Uh, no, I think we're ready to have you, Jana. Okay. So let me share my book. Well, let's see. Can you go to the... Um, Let's see. I don't know. I don't think I have the, um, can you pull up the, 
um, pub slideshow for me? I don't. Yeah. Oh, actually, you know what? Let me do it because I'll need to end up sharing another screen. So let me let me do that. Hang on. Sorry, guys, I didn't think that through. Should I make you the host, Jana? Um, I think I should be able to share in just a second. I gotta get myself ready here, sorry. I got too interested in that small hay beetle thing and I didn't, uh, I didn't get the, uh, didn't get my presentation part pulled up and ready to roll. Okay. Okay, so um, are you guys looking at my screen? Yes. Okay. I have to figure out how to put this in presentation mode. The slideshow link at the top right there, drop down, and then you can start presenting. There you go. There we go. Okay. Um, so the main thing I want to talk about tonight is the swarm list. I'm getting tons of emails already with people who have swarm list questions, and that's great because I love it that you guys are thinking swarms and getting excited about swarms and, um, and, and getting organized ahead of time, which really, um, it helps you and it helps me a ton not to get, you know, 150 people on the first day that we see a swarm, <laughs> trying to get on the swarm list and get it organized. So I really appreciate it. So for new members or anyone who doesn't know how the swarm list works, I just want to go through that really quick and then tell you all the exciting new things that are going on with our swarm list this year. Um, so what happens is someone in the general public will see a swarm and they can report it to us in one of two ways. Um, they can go onto our website and there is a link that says report a swarm um, and, it, and then it walks them through giving us some details about that swarm. Um, or they can just Google, what do I do if I see a swarm? And then our developer is working um, really hard on the SEO to make sure that um, in the Portland area, we pop up in those top um, you know, as a top resource to people who are searching what to do about a swarm. Um, and they can report directly to the swarm software, not even going to our website. So um, he's expanding the ways that we may be able to get swarm calls, which is really nice. So um, once that swarm has been reported via the software, then um, our members who have signed up for the swarm list um, are in a queue and you in just a minute you're going to see new criteria that you are able to filter through um, for the kinds of swarms that you want to get and the computer will say oh um, is you know who can get this swarm and they'll start sending out um, swarm alert texts when you get a text you have about 60 seconds to reply to that um, that you would like that swarm before the computer will go on to the next person. So if you get an alert, you don't have a ton of time to sit there and think about whether you want it or don't want it. Um, one time though, I will say that once that code, that acceptance code is out there, it that code will work for you as long as someone else hasn't um, accepted the swarm. So, one time I got a swarm call in the middle of the night and in the morning I happened to see it and I was like, oh, well, you know, that that swarm thing got was put out there eight or 10 hours ago. There's no way I'll get it. Um, but I accepted it and no one else after me had accepted it. So my, the code still worked and I did get that swarm. 
So it never hurts to respond even after your 60 seconds. Um, if it's already taken, they'll just say, sorry, you didn't win it. Um, so the software just goes through all the basic details, um, matching criteria as it goes and keeps going until someone accepts the swarm. Once you accept the swarm, um, the program will text you information about how to contact the reporter. Um, I highly recommend once you contact the reporter to ask them to send you a picture, um, talk to them about details because um, it is not uncommon for someone to tell you it's a swarm, but it's really mason bees or it's really bumblebees or yellow jackets or something like that. Um, the developer is also trying to cut down on those kind of calls for us um, so that when people are going to report a swarm, there's there's little criteria that they're going to have to go through. You know, are there lots of bees? Are they hanging in a cluster? Is it a single bee? Does it look like this? You know, and stuff. So it's going to help us not get some of those mason bee calls or bumblebee calls. Um, but you still might get them. So I, I do recommend getting a picture. And then you just go to that address and you collect your freebies and, and have fun with them. Um, so we have a couple of new features. For those of you who were on it last year, you know that um, you could put in fil a filter that said, um, I am willing, you put your address in and you say, I'm willing to travel 10 miles from this address to collect bees. And um, this year, you can now, in addition to that distance range, you are going to be able to say which parts of the metro area you are willing to travel to. And this is so awesome because I would get calls last year that were within my range but they were on the east side of town and I'm pretty far on the west side of town. And, you know, five o'clock, I just don't want to go to the east side because the traffic, it would take me an hour and a half to get there, even if it's only seven miles. And so he built in that you can say, I'm only willing to go to south, southwest, west, northwest, north. And so even if it's in your range, if it's not in your area of town, you're not gonna get bugged with a call. Um, I'm gonna pause for a second and see if anyone has questions. I see there's something in the chat, but I'm not looking at the chat right now. Um, is there a way to be a swarm assistant? Oh, so thank you for asking that question, Diana. Um, I, let me, um, let me pause on the features of the swarm list and throw out there um, to answer this question that I am, I am very interested in trying to get swarm mentorship going. I haven't worked on it yet. So I would love to get a list of people who are like you, Diana, that want to just observe catching a swarm or help someone catch a swarm because they've never done it before. Um, and match those up with people who are willing to be a mentor and, and say, hey, you know, and I think the way it would work is like, if I wanted to mentor someone, I would text you, Diana, and say, hey, guess what? I just got a swarm call. I'm leaving. I'll be there in 20 minutes. Can you join me? And then if you can join me in that moment, you can come and observe and help. And if you can't, then you just have to wait till next time. It's really hard. I, th I think it's going to be a hard program for me to put together because um, swarms are so unpredictable. You just, you have to, if you're going to go get one, you have to drop everything and go get it right then because you don't know how long they're going to be. So I am going to try to put something like that together this year. Um, if anyone's interested in either being a mentor or um, being a learner, um, please email me. Um, apiary at portlandurbanbeekeepers.org and I will try to put together a list like that. Um, 
any other questions, you can put them in the chat or you can um, interrupt me at any moment if what I'm saying is not making sense or I'm going too fast or what. So I'm going to pause for a second for questions on anything I've covered so far. Okay, cool. Oh, oh, yep, I will put my, let me put my email in the chat right now. Um, okay, so another filter we're going to be able to put in now is availability. So last year, you could, we had a do not disturb. So say you were going to um, New York for a week and you didn't want to be texted at all hours of the day um, while you're on vacation. You could put yourself on do not disturb. You wouldn't get any texts. The trick then would be remembering to take yourself off do not disturb when you get back from vacation. Now this year, you can select times of the day that you wanna receive alerts. So say that you have a job that you absolutely cannot leave your desk between nine and three, you can block those out and you will not get interrupted with text messages between nine and three and you'll only get the swarm alerts that are outside those blocked off hours. Um, another really awesome filter is swarm height. Um, you are now going to be able to put in an upper limit of how high the swarm is that you are willing to go and catch. Personally, I do not belong on a ladder, probably over, I'll, I'll be honest, probably over 10 or 12 feet, but I will go to, you know, 12 to 15 um, if you don't tell my husband or my kids. <laughs> um, and so, the, it, you know, it was just kind of a waste of resources for me to get any kind of a swarm call that was 30 feet in the air. Um, there's a couple of reasons why these filters are really important. And if you are already on the swarm list, I really, really encourage you to please go in and just take like 60 to seconds to two minutes to add filters. Because one thing is, if you can, if we can filter out contacting you, the swarm list itself is going to run much smoother. Um, if you can imagine, sometimes, um, like I would know that I would be like number 105 in the queue on the swarm list, and I would still, like three hours after it was or maybe not three hours, but an hour or something after it was um, reported, I would, I would even being that low on the list would sometimes get the alert that there was a swarm. So you know that that computer was sending out text and waiting 60 seconds and sending out another text over and over and over again. And it just, the longer that it takes for someone to accept it, the less likelihood that is that that swarm is still gonna be there. So it will make it run much more efficiently. Um, and the other thing it will do is it will help our club out because um, we get charged for every single text that um, gets sent and every text alert that gets sent out. So if, it, if we have to run through 105 people to get someone to accept it, when you know you're never gonna catch that swarm that's 30 feet high, you know, we've just wasted um, some of our club resources. So if you would be willing to go in and do that, that would be super awesome. Questions on the new features. Cool. So, oh, I got ahead of myself. Here's the, here's the reasons why we would love for you to update your profile. Um, this is um, a slide that I wanted to show for why putting your range in or how putting the range in makes a difference in who is going to get a swarm and who is not. Um, this is person A is currently um, 11th on the list. Okay, so the uh, 11th in the queue. 
person B is currently in the first position on the queue. Person A has a much bigger range that they're willing or able to travel than person B. So when the um, software gets the call and the swarm is located where the picture of the B is, even though person B is first on the list, they are not going to even get alerted to it because that swarm is not within their range that they're willing to travel to. It's going to skip right past them. And so, so person A in this case is going to win the alert. Does that make sense to people? But if person B had made a bigger range, then because that swarm is now within their range and they're higher up on the queue list, they will actually win getting first chance of getting that alert. So I hope that makes sense to everybody. So how do you sign up if you're not already on the list? Um, this is the um, website. And if you don't want to scribble that down, you can always just go to Portland Urban Beekeepers. And in the upper right hand corner of our homepage, there's a report a swarm. And if you go about halfway down that report a swarm page, there's a link that says, please fill out this form. And I am going to actually take that to you right now to show you how to do that. So here's the report of swarm. You will click on it. Uh, wrong screen. We still have your slide. Oh, shoot. Sorry. Thank you for telling me. Um, nope. Mm -hmm. Okay, are we on the right one now? Yep, we're there. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so then you just scroll down. I got there right here, report a swarm. And then please fill out this form. If you've already filled out the form, you can do login and um, get your password and do your editing. But you would go to the, um, And let me, we need a registration code or do I still have that saved in my head? This is this year's registration code. I will be e emailing this out in the written instructions. So you can either write this code down now or you can wait for the email, but this is this year's registration code. And you just fill this in and, um, This is the really important thing that last year people seem to miss. If you do not check this box, you will not get any text messages because you have to opt into the texting, okay? So you fill in your information and make a password. And then that way, if you make a password, you are able to go in and change your filters and parameters anytime, as many times as you want. If you move, you change your mind and you want your work address to be your center of your distance range, you can do that. Um, oh, no dashes. And your phone number again. So this is what your profile will look like. And this is where you can set all your filters. Here's the blanket, do not disturb. I'm on vacation, don't text me at all. Um, or say you've caught as many swarms as you want for this year and you're just done getting swarms. Put yourself on do not disturb for the rest of the year. 
makes the list more efficient, saves us money, and then you don't get texts also. Elevation is what they mean by height of the swarm off of the ground. So, you know, I think most people are probably going to be somewhere down here, you know, like 30 feet or less is, you know, probably what most people want. Distance, this is how far away from that address that I just input am I willing to travel? If you don't want to mess a swarm, then leave it at 99. But know that you're going to get alerts for ones that are far away. So, you know, really dial in and, and say how far away you want to go. This is cardinal direction um, from that point of um, that address that you've input. So I'm willing to go 15 miles to the north. I'm not willing to go to the northeast, the east, or the southeast because it just takes me too long traffic-wise, maybe, okay? I'm available seven days a week when it comes to swarm season, but you know what? I'm not a late night girl, so I do not want you to text me until 7 a.m. And I do not want you to text me after 7 p.m. I update myself. And if I'm not getting enough swarm calls, then maybe I'll widen my parameters and I'll be willing to drive further or I'll be willing to go to the east side. So questions about any of these parameters that you can put in. Excellent. Okay, that is everything that I have to tell you about the swarm list. Does anybody else have questions about the swarm list? I don't have my chat open right now. So if there's anything in the chat, uh, somebody let me know. Oh, the chat's empty, Jenna. Okay, thank you. And I am going to change my screen share. Back to this and I will, um, I was asked to give a little apiary report. This time of the year, it's a little bit slower, obviously, because we're not active inside the hives right now. But I do want to let you guys know we have a new shed. Um, it's a little bit bigger. Um, it's a little bit closer to the bees. And um, huge shout out to Bruce Kester, Richard Koss, Stephen Martzoff, and my husband Bruce for making the shed happen and getting it built and getting it level and moving all the stuff in and Shout out to Susie for helping me clean out the old shed and getting this stuff organized and ready to roll for the new one. So that was awesome that I had so much help. I'm currently out of the apiary. We have three Langstroths and one top bar. Um, the, we applied oxalic acid vapor in December and January. Um, we will be doing our apiary um, event. Um, we, have a, we have a dual event going on on Saturday, February 4th at 11 o'clock. Um, part of it is going to be, we're gonna have a workshop for people who would like to learn how to assemble their own hives and frames. Um, this could save you tons of money. So um, we have kits available on our website right now um, that are, actually brand new um, hive bodies and frames uh, from Man Lake and nice quality, brand new. And um, we are selling them at a discount. And plus, obviously, you wouldn't have shipping. Um, so we still have a few of those left if you are interested in that. Um, and if you already have your own um, unassembled frames and or boxes that you're just not quite sure how to put it together or you haven't gotten to the store to buy your wood glue or whatever, um, just contact me at this apiary at portlandurbanbeekeepers.org and let me know that you'd like to bring your own stuff and you can come and use our hammers and cordless screwdrivers and glue and 
and whatnot, and we'll help you uh, learn how to put them together if you want some help with that. Simultaneously, we will also be having a new and used equipment sale. Um, and um, Pub has some new equipment to sell. Um, we have a little bit of used equipment to sell. And then Tim Wessels um, has a ton of used equipment to sell. Um, I believe, I know Pub's equipment that we're selling is all 10 frame equipment. And I believe that Tim's is all 10 frame equipment. He, he may have a teeny bit of eight frame equipment, but it's not much. So if you want eight frame equipment, don't really count on that as a source, but come and check it out. Um, we will not be able, and Tim will also not be able to accept uh, credit cards. So please bring cash or check. Um, and just know that the pricing will be um, below retail, um, even for the new stuff. And um, you will, on the used stuff, Tim is giving really good deals if you want used equipment. Does anyone have any questions about the event on Saturday? Either event? Okay. Um, B days in the apiary are gonna be starting up in March or April, depending on the weather. Um, I really, really, for lots of reasons, hope we're starting in March. Um, if you haven't been to the apiary, it's really an awesome place. It's just in a cool area. Um, Green Anchors is kind of a, an artist community. And so it's kind of cool to be out there anyway. Um, but there's lots of bees. We have, we have our four hives and um, Tim has like 35. So there's a ton of bees out there. Um, we love all experience levels. Um, and we, we have a very hands-on um, approach. So if you've never had bees or um, you're just getting into bees, um, you will get experience pulling frames and looking at them and identifying drones and um, the capped brood and what's the difference between the capped brood and the honey, you know? what? you know, because they're both capped and what's the difference and um, all that kind of stuff. So um, it's really fun. And we meet the first and third Sundays of the month. Um, early in the season, we're going to meet 11 to 1 just to let it have a little bit of time to um, warm up a little bit so that we can open the hives easier. Um, and then as the summer gets going and it starts getting hotter, we'll meet 10 to 12 so that we're not opening them in the hottest part of the day and we can get in um, a little bit when it's a little bit cooler. Um, anybody have questions about the apiary coming out on B days or anything? Awesome, that's all I have. I will turn it back over to you, Brent. Okay, great. Thank you, Janet. Well, I think that that's um, I think that that's pretty much all that we have to um, talk about tonight. I'm trying to find our um, screen that I want to share again, and that's not coming up for some reason. There it is. So. Um, We already passed all these. Okay, I guess that's it. If there's no more questions, then we definitely hope you, to see you at the event this Saturday. I, ha I have one question. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, this is Josh. Um, I was just wondering uh, about um, purchasing nukes this year. Are you guys going to be sponsoring any event like that? Um, no, we are not planning on um, having nukes to sell this year. Um, we are hoping to um, start a queen worry program out of the apiary. Um, so in April, 
um, we will likely be starting to raise some queens and um, kind of doing twofold of um, selling queens a couple of days before they emerge from their cells so that you can take them uh, to your own um, split that you might want to do and uh, let her emerge and it just kind of gets your split off to a faster start um, if, since the queen's going to be really um oh yeah jen i will put that a registration code in the chat here in just a second um the um so that will be one thing that we can do to help you out with that um potentially depending on how our bees um out at green acre anchors make it through the um winter if we do some splits we don't have room to have more um, colonies than our four out there. So if we have to do splits, then we may have um, those to sell. Um, but we also may not, depending on um, how the queen rearing step goes. So there's a whole bunch of flux going on with that right now. So it's kind of a long way of saying I'm not really sure, but we have not contracted with anybody um, to sell nukes. Um, I know somebody put on the Facebook page, um, somebody in Salem um, is selling nukes and advertised that on our Facebook page recently. So that might be something to check out. Um, and let me go see if I can find that swarm code. That's the swarm list registration code. And it will be going out um, in an email. Um, once the video recording is ready, we will be, I'll be sending this um, code out in the email as well. And I guess the other thing to let people know too is make sure your dues are current because if your dues are not current, I will be kicking you off of the swarm list. And you can always email me if you need confirmation on that. Yeah, that was sent out in a in an email, right? Or if your uh, fees are not current, that's sent out in an email usually, right? Yeah, usually we yeah usually there's an automated email that the system sends out saying, "Hey, your dues are about to expire," and then there's one that says, "Your dues have expired," um, but. You know, if you if you don't happen to get that or whatever, then um, and you're not sure, just email me at the apiary email address, and I will look it up for you and let you know if you're current or not. Um, and then if if I'm not going to just kick someone off the swarm list without letting them know, I will give you an opportunity to say, hey, your dues are expired. You have until this day to get them current before I take you off. So I'm not just going to take you off and not let you know. Just wondering, Jana, can we pay our dues at the apiary or do we need to follow the link at the website to do you that? You need to follow the link at the website. It's the, it's the best way to do it. Um, I mean, there's a workaround way that I technically, once I got home, could go in the back door and do it. But um, last time I tried to do that, there was kind of a problem with it. And then it was kind of a mess for our IT guy to sort it all out. So. It'd be better if, if people just do it on the website. Okay. Wow, Jana, thank you for such a wonderful update on these important new features. And we are so excited about seeing you at the apiary and finding out what's going on uh, there and wishing you the best of luck with your queen rearing project mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. year. All right then, everybody, thank you so much for coming to our February meeting. This was recorded and it will be posted on our website. The link to the video will be posted on the website. And I, for one, I'm gonna watch it again. And I'm gonna hope that I never have to uh, experience that smell 
that Susan <laughs> was talking about. But um, so uh, get ready for our next uh, members meeting that will happen in March. And until then, I hope to see you at the apiary, everybody. Thank you so much. I guess that's the official end of our February meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, all. Bye. Okay. Sure.